the next item of business is portfolio questions on the rural economy. I'll try and get all questions and supplementaries in if people are succinct. And question number one is Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the fishing industry regarding compensation arrangements in relation to the impact of offshore wind farm developments. Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government has been working closely with fishermen and stakeholder organisations to seek to improve relationships between the fishing and renewable sectors. We are absolutely committed to trying to put working relationships between the two on a more positive footing. But it should be recognised the Scottish Government has no formal role or powers in relation to the award of compensation concerning the impact of offshore wind farm developments on the fishing industry and no legal remit to participate in compensation arrangements. Well, they're ready. Fishermen working the prawn and creel boats from the ports in Fife are anxious about whether the compensation from Red Rock and EDF will be enough. The huge motorway-wide cables crisscrossing the North Sea will be located slap bang in the middle of their fishing grounds, disrupting routes they have worked for generations. Compared to these massive companies, these fishermen feel powerless. I have met EDF and will meet Red Rock soon, but what more can the minister do to make sure the fishermen get fair compensation? Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, I have met with some of the fishermen, those, uh, some of them in Pitt and Weem on the 15th of April. Uh, I listened carefully to their concerns about lack of engagement in relation to cable burial and route and timescale of works. And my behest officials had a follow-up meeting with them on the 30th of April. And I understand that a further meeting is taking place uh, with uh, Marine Scotland officials, uh, developers and fishermen in Pitt and Weem, I believe tomorrow, presiding officer. So I'm determined that we find a solution which allows both renewables and the fishing sector both to thrive and flourish. And that means very careful consideration of the cable issue in particular. I undertake to Mr. Rennie uh, and to Mr. Gethins, the MP who has raised this matter with me, that I will consider these matters myself very carefully, working with my colleague Paul, Paul Wheelhouse for safety grounds and for um, avoiding damage to fishing gear. It's extremely important that burial of cable is, takes place wherever possible and practicable, and the direct route of that is something that uh, I would expect to be considered extremely carefully indeed. After all, presiding officer, the fishermen were there first. Quick supplementary, please, Maureen Watt. Thank you, presiding officer. Given that the fishermen have in-depth knowledge of where the best fishing grounds are, would it be, not be more effective just not to cite new developments where these grounds have been identified in the next rounds of wind, offshore wind? Fergus Ewing. Well, I, I do certainly agree that it is sensible that those involved in both sectors should communicate closely with each other. After all, as Maureen Watt well knows, the fishermen have an extensive and detailed knowledge of the seabed in their areas. And that is knowledge that, that uh, if they, there is proper collaboration between them and the renewable sector could be put to good use. Scottish ministers use a process of sector marine planning to identify future areas for commercial scale offshore wind developments. And this does consider, presiding officer, a wide range of data. And this, of course, illustrates where fishing takes place as part of an overall analysis of opportunities and constraints. Uh, and therefore, I do believe that these are matters which uh, are required and are, in fact, uh, the subject of proper and appropriate consideration during, during the development process. Question number two, Alison Harris. Last, oh, sorry. sorry. To ask the Scottish Government what its plans are for Farm Safety Week 2019. Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government works closely with partners such as the Health and Safety Executive to provide support and guidance to farmers, to their employees and families to help make farms safer environments to work and live on. We are also involved, presiding officer, in the Scottish Farm Safety Partnership, which is committed to working to reduce farm workplace fatal accidents by 50% by 2023. The Farm Safety Week, to which the member alludes, will seek to highlight the importance of this issue, and we are considering the role the Scottish Government might play this year. The NFUS has already issued a call for examples from farmers of how they have made safety improvements on farm, and more importantly, the inspiration behind these changes in behaviour. Alison Harris. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? 
Only a month ago, two people were killed as a result of a tragic accident on a farm in my own constituency of Central Scotland. So in light of the fact that, that it is Child Safety Week this week, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Scottish Government have made provision for children's safety on our farms? Fergus Ewing. Well, I'm aware of uh, the incident to which Alison Harris alludes. This was a, a tragic accident uh, where two men died after a wall collapsed at a farm. Uh, and, you know, our, our thoughts are, go out to the families involved. And it does illustrate that, that um, fatalities and serious injuries on in farms are very, very serious matter. Of course, as the member, I think all members appreciate, the prime responsibility for safety lies with ourselves and with employers to properly look after ourselves and those for whom we are responsible. And I think it does need to be said that that principle is never actually going to change. The Health and Safety Executive is a reserved uh, body, but we work closely with them. We fund uh, or we, we part fund uh, organizations such as Lantra, which provide training. And last year they provided training courses in the central belt this year in Dumfries in respect of areas such as falls from heights and falling objects, cattle, vehicles and machinery. But I'm pleased to have the opportunity to answer Alison Harris because this is one of the most, uh, this is probably the area of life in Scotland where there is still a far, far too high level of injuries and of course any death is one too many. A short supplementary please, Emma Harper. There are around a thousand injuries and two deaths each year as a result of quad bike accidents in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary might be aware of my ongoing campaign to encourage quad bike wearing, quad bike helmet wearing, right? So can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if he'll join me in encouraging farmers and agricultural workers to wear helmets both on and off the road and would he be open to meeting with me to discuss potential action the Scottish Government can take to further the same? Fergus Shewing. Hey. Yes, I, I am aware of, of the risk of uh, those who drive in quad bikes uh, without wearing helmets. It's not macho, it's stupid. Uh, and I commend Emma Harper for her campaign on this, and I'd be very happy to meet with her and discuss what, uh, if anything, further we can do. Question number three, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress being made on payments to farmers. Fergus Hewing. We've made 17,749 basic payment scheme loan offers worth over 343.6 million in uh, a, a, the autumn last year, earlier than in previous years, which put cash into the rural economy ahead of any other part of the UK. Basic payments for 2018 started on the 19th of March with over 14,300 payments worth £289.8 million made to date. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm pleased to say that we are on track to deliver both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 payments in line with the schedule published in December last year, and we're also on track to meet our regulatory target of making 95% of Pillar 1 payments by the end of this month. Willie Coffey. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. He will be aware of the uncertainty being caused by Brexit to sheep farmers, including those in my constituency. What is he doing to ensure that they have the financial support they need in these uncertain times? I'm acutely aware of the, uh, of the uncertainty caused by Brexit and the worries faced by our sheep farmers and our hill farmers in general. Th this is a very serious issue indeed, and I'm pleased Mr Coffey has raised it. What have we done? Well, we uh, announced the Elfast loan scheme in March, giving eligible farmers and profiters access to 90% of the Elfast payment. Uh, uh, and that, uh, that, that, I think, has been something that has been appreciated as a practical measure. In addition to that, I have repeatedly pressed uh, the UK government, uh, along with my Welsh and Northern Irish colleagues at the meetings that I attend with Ms. Ms. Goujon and the UK ministers, including Mr. Gove, that there should be a properly funded, treasury funded compensation scheme in the event of a no deal. However, presiding officer, a no deal would be utterly catastrophic for our hill farmers and sheep farmers in particular, and therefore, I very much hope that it will be averted. Uh, short supplementaries, please, Rhoda Grant and Donald Cameron. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Because of the climate crisis, uh, farmers and crofters need to know what assistance is going to be available to them to reach net zero. Will the Cabinet Secretary, as a matter of urgency, bring forward a new scheme that helps them achieve that goal? Rhoda Grant. Sorry. Fair 
Uh, well, thank you, President Officer. We set out our plans in our document, Stability and Simplicity, uh, and uh, those plans do, of course, provide um, something which, uh, with respect, isn't uh, provided to their counterparts elsewhere in the UK, uh, namely the relative confidence that the existing support which, uh, uh, which is enjoyed by Scottish farmers and hill farmers in particular will continue. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, but we also, uh, in the second part of the five-year period of stability and simplicity, have, uh, as set out in, in that document, uh, stability and simplicity, set out uh, our plans that we will pilot ways in which to promote even more sustainable farming. Uh, I am convinced, however, uh, as I discussed with Martin Kennedy, whom I met last week at a, his farm in Aberfeldy, that actually the work that farmers do show that they are part of the solution, not part of the problem, and that mixed livestock production, sustaining as it does ruminants on our hillsides, actually sequester carbon in permanent grassland. And if it wasn't for their activity, as many members in this chamber know better than I, uh, then there would be devastatingly bad consequences through the loss of that carbon sequestration. And I think it's our duty to get these positive messages about farming's existing contribution to the climate better understood and acknowledged. Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer to farming and crofting in my register of interest? Um, does the Cabinet Secretary, who mentioned Elfas in one of his answers, does, does he acknowledge the comments from the NFUS less favoured area committee chair, Robin MacDonald, who said that a bigger funding issue for our hill farming and crofting sectors is potential cuts to Elfas in 2019 and 2020? Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary give us an update and especially reassure those worried farmers and crofters on this particular matter? Fergus Ewing. Yes, I, I know uh, uh, Robert MacDonald well and have, have met him and his colleagues. He chairs the LFAS committee of the NFUS uh, on, on several occasions. In fact, I met the NFUS just, uh, uh, just yesterday again and discussed this. I'm very pleased that uh, this year we maintained the LFAS at 100%, uh, even although our ability to do so only became evident at the relatively late period in the financial year. We were able to maintain that, and this year, I believe it's the case that I think, from memory, 56% of LFAS recipients have received more than they received before, slightly. Uh, Mr. Cameron asked about the next two years. Um, the EU rules uh, provide that the payments must be reduced over the next two years. I've indicated that we wish to do everything we can to find a workaround to prevent that from happening. Uh, it is a very technical and complex area, not made any simpler, I have to say, or easier by the fact that we don't actually know whether we're going to be in or out of Europe, and therefore we do not know which rules will apply. But be all that as it may, presiding officer, I will do my very best to ensure that our whole farmers receive the support which, my goodness me, they earn. Uh, questions and particularly answers, Cabinet Secretary, are getting a bit lengthy if we're to get through this. So question number four, Margaret Mitchell. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of the Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime. Marie Goujon. The Scottish Partnership Against Rural Crime continues to play a valuable role in bringing together key partners from across the rural and justice sectors to tackle all forms of criminality in our rural communities. The partnership recently produced its Rural Crime Strategy 2019 to 2022, highlighting its focus on tackling serious and organised crime as it affects rural communities. And work is also underway to strengthen local approaches to tackling rural crime across Scotland. Earlier this year, the Cabinet Secretary participated in the launch of the new East Lothian Partnership Against Rural Crime, le led by East Lothian Council, and a similar initiative is just about to begin in Tayside, and that will bring together local authorities, police and other partners to strengthen the local approach to rural crime. And in April, my ministerial colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, participated in the launch of a new Scottish Heritage Crime Group, which is formed under the auspices of SPARC to tackle crime against our historic and cultural sites. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, I thank the, the Minister for that comprehensive answer. She would be aware that the rural economy is negatively impacted by rural crimes such as livestock worrying and theft, but also by fly tipping, which has a hugely detrimental impact on the farmers, landowners <coughs> and local authorities that have to bear the cost of cleaning up these sites. In order to address this worrying and escalating problem, will the Minister support my campaign, which includes giving local authorities, agencies, occupiers or owners of land, 
the same powers as their counterparts in England and Wales to make compensation orders to recover the costs in cards for clearing these sites. Marie Cougeon. I'm really glad that Margaret Mitchell's raised this serious issue because fly tipping is a serious issue in rural areas and it seriously blights our countryside as well. And uh, well, it's actually my ministerial colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, who has portfolio responsibility for this issue. But I know that the Cabinet Secretary would be happy to further consider the proposals that have been suggested uh, by Margaret Mitchell um, because I do think that this is a very serious issue that we need to take a look at. And I think if there are other powers we can look at there that would help tackle this, then that's, then that's what we need to consider. Question number five, Keith Brown. To ask the Scottish Government what information it has regarding the progress being made with the review of intra-UK allocation of domestic farm funding that is being led by Lord Bew. Fergus The review panel has been taking evidence, including from me, and I understand it's close to making its final recommendations. Progress is, however, being hampered by the UK Government, uh, as Michael Gove has confirmed in writing that he is not prepared to release to the view, uh, the view panel previous advice to ministers. This is disappointing as he promised this information not only to me but to Scottish stakeholders mm -hmm. in a public debate that I had with him. I raised this uh, when I met the panel on the 15th of May and made clear that in any future funding arrangements, whether in the UK or the EU, it would be totally unacceptable, totally unacceptable if Scotland continues to receive payment at the lowest rates per hectare of any country in <laughs> Europe. A quite outrageous situation. Keith Brown. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response and ask whether that means that there have been no assurances from the UK Government that the £160 million denied to farmers in Scotland, including those in my constituency, will be returned to Scotland, that a future funding formula will be fair to Scotland's interests and that the full value of current direct farm support will be provided by the UK Government to the Scottish Government after 2022, once its guarantee runs out. Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, Mr Brown is absolutely right to raise this. this. This is money that was intended by the EU for Scottish farmers, and to which only Scottish hill farmers were entitled. Uh, uh, and the UK Government diverted this money away from them to a tune of £14,000 for every farmer and, Scot uh, and crofter in Scotland, £14,000. This is quite a scandalous act by the UK government. And Mr Gove promised that the review first indicated by Owen Paterson in 13 would be implemented. He was overruled by the Treasury, who overruled him and said that they couldn't do that. The review is now only looking at two years and not at what happened and to explain why this happened and why our farmers were deprived of this money. The fact that the UK government are concealing the evidence about the advice given to them on the basis of which they took the decision to divert that money away from Scottish hill farmers and crofters is one of the most disgraceful acts in government I have come across in my 20 years as an MSP. Question number six, Jamie Halcrow Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it can provide an update on the work of the Orkney Native Wildlife Project and what it is doing to support the project's objectives. <laughs> Marie Goujon. The Orkney Native Wildlife Project is being led by Scottish Natural Heritage and the RSPB and they've been in discussion with local represent representatives of the National Farmers Union of Scotland about establishing a land access protocol governing the setting of traps for stoats on agricultural land. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. I uh, thank the Minister for that and I'd like to uh, draw the Chamber to my register of interest. The project's work to control stoats is currently at a standstill with many local farmers still refusing access to their land because of the anger of the, that their concerns over geese numbers are not being properly addressed. Farmers are looking for a clear, indi a clear indication that the Scottish Government understands the problem, that they appreciate the damage the geese are doing and that they will act on geese numbers because pr Deputy Presiding Officer, failure to get stoat traps in place in the next few months could lead to an explosion in numbers. So can the Minister outline what actions she can take and what resource she can allocate to support efforts to control the goose population in Orkney? And in order to break the impasse before the summer, would she consider incentivising farmers to provide access with a bounty on stoats trapped on their land? Marie Gouchon. 
This is an, uh, an issue that I'd be happy to discuss further with the member if he'd uh, like to have a meeting with me to discuss that because I know that Scottish Natural Heritage have convened uh, an Orkney Goose Management Group to investigate how future ad adaptive management of grey lag geese can be supported. So that is being looked at. Uh, as a partnership, the group will look to develop, agree and implement additional measures to reduce the impact of the resident geese population. But again, if the member would like a meeting, I'd be more than happy for that to take place. Uh, short supplementary would be appreciated, please, Liam McCarthy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Could I um, welcome that commitment to a meeting from the, the Minister? As Jamie Halker Johnson has indicated, there is anger at the contrast between the funding for the Stoke programme and the withdrawal of funding for the goose management programme. So I think it would be helpful if the Minister were able to, to discuss with us how that, the work of that uh, goose management group can now be supported, including funding being made available. Mary Gujo. And again, I would extend that same offer to Liam McArthur as well to see how we can move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are two members who I haven't been able to call, and that's Rona Mackay and Tom Mason, and I apologise for that. Can I say to, to all members that I don't want to be cutting people off in their prime, either when they're asking questions or when they're answering, but what we had there uh, were quite a few speeches rather than questions. So can I ask that perhaps uh, people discuss this within their groups with a view to making sure that everyone gets an equal opportunity to take part in these question and answer sessions. And that concludes portfolio questions. We'll move on to the next item of business. If everyone would like to shift their seats accordingly.